Folks, I love bosses. Big scary bosses. Demons, knights, gods, dragons, beasts, eldritch monstrosities, you name it, and I want to fight, learn, and then dramatically and cathartically defeat it for a wealth of souls, blood echoes, or runes. Of course, boss fights were a thing way before the Souls games came along, but I think FromSoft just about perfected the art by adding in their distinctive brand of difficulty, compelling lore and memorable designs. Ones that just stick with you, though I guess dying to a boss 30 times before beating it can certainly help thoroughly ingrain it in one's memory. Over a 3 month period between June and August of this year, I put out retrospectives on every Soulsborne game, because I love them. Even Dark Souls 2, kinda. And because I know a lot about these games, and enjoy talking about them, and indeed, even after I put out my final vid in the series, I still wanted to keep talking about them. And that brings us to this video, where I do what everybody else does, and make a list. A fun list of stuff. I'll be going through each of the seven Soulsborne titles, starting from Demon Souls and ending in Elden Ring, naming and discussing my favourite and least favourite boss from each game. Let me make clear that there's nothing objective about this list. I'm not saying these are definitively the best and worst bosses. I'm just saying these are my personal favourites and least favourites. Nothing more. As for the specific criteria I've used for determining all this, there are none. There's nothing academic about this. It's just a bit of fun. I might even contradict myself throughout the video or stop making sense entirely. Who knows? I don't know. Before kicking off with the first entry in the list, let me first give a fond thank you to my generous benefactors, patrons of the arts. And with that said, let's get started. Ah, Demon Souls, the Souls progenitor, the OG, kicking off all sorts of motifs and mechanics we'd learn and love over the subsequent Souls games and beyond, even in Elden Ring which still uses the bloodstain mechanic found in that first game. Boss wise though, I'd say it's the weakest entry in the Soulsborne catalogue. That's not to say the bosses were bad, because there were a few rather spectacular ones, but mechanically, and certainly in terms of enemy AI, some are to be found lacking. Regardless, I've always had an enormous fondness for the Tower Knight, the boss of the second stage in Boletaria. The fight is such a damn spectacle, and you can really feel the weight and power behind those slow metallic animations. Of course, you only really fight the actual thing for about half the battle, first having to take care of the crossbowman firing from above, an idea FromSoft would later repeat in the One Reborn boss from Bloodborne, but attacking the Tower Knight's vulnerable feet has always felt really satisfying. The way the distinctive blue soul power sprays and radiates out after each blow to its armour before it falls flat on its heavy iron arse, allowing you to attack the head or body for maximum damages. It's not a particularly difficult boss, and in fact I've never died to it, ever. But it is very fun, satisfying and makes for a great conclusion to an already great level. But I'll tell you what's not fun, and that's the boss of the second stage of the Tower of Latria, the Man Eaters. I guess this was something of a precursor to the Gargoyle boss from Dark Souls 1, with the way the second enemy joins the fight around halfway through, except the arena here is significantly more treacherous, and the boss AI is significantly more broken. The Man Eaters are one of the hardest bosses in the game, if not the hardest, and while the challenge posed by their moveset and the narrowness of the walkway where the fight takes place is certainly a major part of that, another unfortunate contributor is just how damn janky it is. Several Demon Souls bosses feature rather unintelligent artificial intelligence, an aspect which was, if anything, highlighted even further in the 2020 remake when set within the game's pristine graphics but the man-eaters are by far the worst offender. They'll randomly fly off into the night, mid-attack, before awkwardly circling back, sometimes being unable to even get onto the damn walkway because they flew in too low, or landing on a pillar and chilling there for a few seconds before hopefully jumping back down and rejoining the fight, and sometimes they'll even use attacks mid-flight which were clearly only intended to be used when grounded. There are some boss fights where I can't wait for it to be over, due to the challenge they pose, like Ishin Sword Saint from Sekiro. 
I don't think Ishin is a bad boss, I just crave the relief that will come when I finally conquer him and I'm done. But for man eaters, the reason I can't wait for the fight to be over is because I am actively having an unpleasant time while fighting them. Of course, another valid candidate for this spot would have been the Dragon God, because again, it's also not particularly fun to fight and has also caused me a great deal of frustration in the past, but even so it's still a relatively coherent boss and very impressive visually, whereas neither of those things can be said about the man eaters. Now that I've said my piece, let's move on to the next game. Now Dark Souls 1 is where the bosses started to get really freaking good, with increased challenge, complexity and some incredible designs, big meaty ones too. There's a certain satisfaction that comes with laying into the fat ass of the Asylum Demon or its variants, same with behemoths like the Gaping Dragon, Taurus Demon and Seath the Scaleless. Like many fans of these games, Dark Souls 1 was the one that popped my cherry, introducing me to a new world of challenge, frustration and then triumphant victory and I still have nightmares about my first painful encounters with the Bell Gargoyles and the Capra Demon. There are a bunch of great bosses in the first game and a few damn tough ones too, but for me the greatest of them all is Knight Artorius from the Artorius of the Abyss DLC. You hear tales of Artorius throughout the base game of course and fight his loyal great grey wolf deep within Darkwood Forest, but it's not until venturing through Ulysseal on the DLC that we finally encounter the legendary knight himself, though by this time the cloying taint of the Abyss has robbed him of his capability for reason, just as it would later do to the Abyss Watchers in Dark Souls 3. Artorius makes for one of the most challenging bosses in the game with his dexterous swipes, flips and thrusts. He's one that's almost guaranteed to cause at least a few deaths to even the most confident of Souls players due to the sheer aggressiveness of his moveset and his fairly sizeable HP pool, though I've always found that the most enjoyable way to take him on is actually on New Game Plus, where his HP is about 55% higher, because then there's no running in and blindly spamming attacks until he's beaten, you need to properly learn his moveset. It can be quite striking going back to the first Dark Souls and seeing just how soft a lot of its bosses are, compared to how tanky they tend to get in later from soft games, especially if you get your hands on a decent Black Knight weapon early on, but back to Artorius, I think he's pretty much a perfect boss, and not only the greatest from Dark Souls 1, but probably in the top 5 of all Soulsborne games. And then there's Bed of Chaos. I had to think twice about including this one here just because of how damn cliche it is, but really, how could I not? It's irredeemably bad. This encounter is detested by nearly everyone who plays the game, and for very, very good reason. There's no actual fighting involved, the very ground can suddenly open up before you as you're running to one of its two weak points, the boss's sweeping swipes are specifically designed to push you into said cracks in the ground, it can kill you in a single hit with its chaos storm attack, even whilst inside its core, and to top it all off, even the damn run back is a stinker, forcing you to re-equip the orange charred ring every time you die just so you can cross the lava. I've probably beaten Dark Souls 1 over 15 times at this point, but even so, I don't think I've ever managed to beat the Bed of Chaos without dying at least once. It almost always takes me a few attempts, and almost every time I do die, the death is frustrating, rather than leaving me thinking, yeah fair enough, I played poorly there. Of course, Bed of Chaos does tend to be the most popular choice for worst DS1 boss, and so if I had to pick a runner up, Centipede Demon, I choose you. Very messy encounter all round, with an overly chaotic visual design, obnoxious arena and weird hitboxes. The only saving grace with the centipede demon is that it's not particularly difficult and doesn't have all that much health, otherwise it might just have beaten the bed of chaos for my least favourite Dark Souls 1 boss. On to the next game. Dear oh dear. Dark Souls 2 eh? I've had a lot of good times with this much blind entry in the Souls series and I've even had a few bad times. Anyone who's seen my retrospective on the game knows that I had a recent change of heart about Dark Souls 2. I used to love it, just about as much as all the other Soulsborne games, and then I guess I played it one too many times and realised I no longer felt the same way. 
Nonetheless, something I've always loved about Dark Souls 2 is its sheer volume of bosses. Now, they're certainly not all humdingers. I mean, I don't think the Royal Rat Vanguard, Skeleton Lords or Scorpioness Najka are ever going to make anyone's all-time favourite Dark Souls boss lists. But nonetheless, I like fighting bosses. And Dark Souls 2 has a lot of them, complete with big soul rewards and boss souls to make lots of cool weapons and spells. As for my number one favourite boss from the game, well, it has to go to the Fume Knight from the Crown of the Old Iron King DLC. I actually had to think really hard about this one, because there's a bunch of great bosses from both the base game and DLCs, like Velstat, Sorolon, the Looking Glass Knight, the Blue Smelter Demon, the Pursuer and more, but for me, the Fume Knight takes the cake. I wasn't joking about the Blue Smelter Demon by the way, I legitimately think it's a great boss. The Fume Knight is known as one of the hardest bosses in DS2 of course, and yeah, he is tough, and I've certainly done my fair share of dying to him, and in fact, I've fought and died to him so much that I'm a damn pro at the boss now, and that's another reason why I like it so much, it's because I can confidently beat him first try on any fresh playthrough, and it's great fun. Another cool aspect of the boss is that its second phase can be triggered early if you enter wearing the helm of Velstat, and that's the kind of hidden touch that I really appreciate. While the follow-up game Dark Souls 3 was of course chock full of references, both subtle and overt, to the first game in the series, it was pretty sparse when it came to Dark Souls 2 references, but the Fume Knight's colossal weapon, the Fume Ultra Greatsword, did make another glorious appearance, and that's something, I guess. As for my least favourite, this was another one I had to think real hard about, not least of all because of how many bosses there are in Dark Souls 2, and it also raises the question of the difference between a bad boss and an underwhelming boss, because while there's a bunch of the latter here, there's not that many of the former. I mean, the covetous demon is an underwhelming boss, but it's not bad. In fact, I kind of like fighting it, even though it poses next to no challenge. Same with the old dragon slayer. Bad bosses do exist in this game though, and I'm sure many of you already have a good idea of what this entry might be. It's the afflicted grave robber, ancient soldier Varg, and Sarah the old explorer, aka the gank squad, fought in the crown of the sunken king DLC. These guys suck. For a start, the run back to them is absolutely horrendous. DS2 has by far the worst runbacks of any Soulsborne game, but the Cave of the Dead is beyond a joke. I literally don't understand the game design rationale for brutal boss runbacks. All it does is unnecessarily piss the player off after dying to a boss. Although I made the distinction between bad bosses and underwhelming bosses, the Gank Squad is kind of both. It's just a fight with three NPCs in the Souls game which happens to feature the worst NPC fights, and to make matters worse, it can be really hard. A lot of it will involve running around trying to create space between the different fighters, because trying to fight all three at once is a recipe for disaster, and not fun. Even their dumb names irritate me too. The Afflicted Grave Robber, Ancient Soldier Varg, just admit it from soft, you either ran out of time or just couldn't think of a cool boss to put here, and so put three bland NPCs with non-unique armour here instead. I'll take a blue smelter demon over this trio of arseholes any day of the week. Dark Souls 3 is a very special entry in the Soulsborne pantheon because I'm of the opinion that the general quality of bosses in this game is higher than any of the others, to the point where I can't call any of them bad. In fact, most of them are excellent, and a few are downright incredible. I'd also say that the general difficulty of bosses was at its most finely tuned in Dark Souls 3, because while this is certainly a challenging game, it's not too challenging but as I must confess that I did at times feel a wee bit alienated with the difficulty of Sekiro and Elden Ring. Needless to say, this was another game where, because of all the talent on display, I struggled to pick favourites, but even so, I did come up with a name, and in fact, not only is he my favourite Dark Souls 3 boss, but he's my all-time favourite Soulsborne boss. It's Slave Knight Gale, fought in the Ringed City DLC the largest boss arena in the Dark Souls series, an incredible opening cutscene, not to mention the banger that plays halfway through. 
an insanely varied array of attacks to deal with, from Gale's broken sword, repeating crossbow and cape, and a soaring, thunderous soundtrack, complementing the tragedy of this incredible character both beautifully and perfectly. The fact that this was the very last Dark Souls boss also adds a bit of sadness to the whole affair, especially when coupled with the heartbreaking cutscene just prior with Princess Filianor, and the fact that the entire world seems to have fallen to ruin and dust in this distant, desolate time, who knows how long into the future. The fight with Gale is FromSoft at their best, and again, the difficulty level is perfect. He's a challenging boss for sure, but personally I've never experienced any frustration when fighting him. On the contrary, I'm always eager to get straight back in there for another round. In a way, my least favourite boss of Dark Souls 3 is a wee bit similar to my entry for Dark Souls 2, being both DLC and NPC based. It's half Light, also fought in the Ring City DLC. To be frank, I harbour no real malice towards the half Light fight. It's just not very interesting, being a battle against the NPC of the same name, and assisted by guardians summoned by Adjudicator Argo. The opening words of Argo, as well as the way he seems to fade away midway through the fight, do a lot for this encounter, adding a certain degree of epicness to it. And this does all take place directly before encountering Filianor, and then the follow-up fight with Gale. Also, although the boss arena itself is pretty damn cool, it looks absolutely jaw-dropping from outside, especially with the twin greatsword-wielding ringed knight standing guard outside. See, even though it's my pick for least favourite fight in the game, here I am complimenting it. That's how sick Dark Souls 3's bosses are. I could try and rack my brains for some more negative things to say about this encounter, but I'm not gonna, because then that would make this list feel more forced and artificial than it should be. It's my number one favourite game of all of Soulsborne, the great and powerful Bloodborne. That gothic horror masterpiece of blood, beasts and even blood-starved beasts. Not only do I consider it one of the best games of all time, but it also has one of the best DLCs of all time with the Old Hunters, which brings us to my favourite Bloodborne boss, Ludwig the Accursed, though the orphan of course comes in a very, very close second. The Old Hunters DLC actually takes a wee while before you encounter the first boss, and it builds the anticipation as you wonder what the hell the game's gonna throw at you, travelling through twisted, incomplete, nightmare versions of the Cathedral Ward and Central Yarnum, and then through a river of blood, but it's the source of the blood which brings us to Ludwig, first hunter of the church, now transformed into the most monstrous, frenzied beast seen so far. It's a terrifyingly difficult fight as you're set upon by tooth and stomped on with hoof, and despite how many bloody times I've beaten Bloodborne, this nightmare version of Ludwig can still give me nightmares before I work out how and when to dodge his ferocious onslaught of primal attacks. He's a very tough boss, but you gradually work out how to deal with him, and then phase 2 happens, introducing that familiar pale blade of legend, the Holy Moonlight Sword and all of a sudden, Ludwig regains some lost sentience, even speaking eloquently, his stance taking on new form and poise as the first hunter of the church. This former hunter of beasts remembers himself, thrusting and slicing through the arena with his grand arcane greatsword as the ground erupts in green fulminations of enigmatic moon magic. Incredible boss in all regards, and there are echoes of Artorius here too, the way you hear of Ludwig through the base game, only to eventually encounter him in the DLC, where he's completely lost himself. Now, I'm going to exclude the Chalice Dungeon bosses when considering my least favourite in the game, because while they are still technically bosses, they're a different kind of boss, and I don't really feel that the Man-Eater Boar or Keeper of the Old Lords should be on the same stage as Vicar Amelia or Abritus. Just like with Dark Souls 3, there aren't really any bosses from Bloodborne that I can't stand, though some are certainly stronger than others. For example, the Witches of Hemwick are a pretty underwhelming boss, but they're really not bad. 
I guess my least favourite would have to be Miko Wash, because there was a lot of missed potential here. The boss arena is really interesting, being one of the only Soulsborne encounters requiring actual navigation through a level, and Miko Lash's frequent commentary as you're running through hallways and down staircases adds massively to the atmosphere and memorability of the encounter. The only thing that lets it all down is Miko Lash himself, because quite frankly, he's shit. It's just an NPC fight who uses basic unarmed moves, as well as the Augur of Abritus and A Call Beyond two non-unique skills that other enemies also use. The A Call Beyond aspect in particular is annoying because it's one of the most overpowered moves in the game, and so while Miko Lash is mostly a really easy boss, he can also just bust out this move and easily one-shot you, and it really doesn't make for a good time. This boss honestly could have been so much better, and the Old Hunters DLC went on to show just how incredible human-sized enemies could be, but alas, Miko Lash was something of a letdown, to the point where I never particularly look forward to fighting him on any given playthrough. In my view, Sekiro is the single hardest Soulsborne game. Certain bosses from Elden Ring definitely rank up there in terms of difficulty, but as a whole, I've got to give the difficulty crown to Sekiro. I know some folk don't consider Sekiro to be a Soulsborne game at all, but I do. I think it's got a lot more in common with FromSoft's other modern titles than it has significant differences, and that's about as far as I'm remotely interested in delving into that debate. Sekiro may indeed be really freaking hard, but it's also an amazing game, and probably FromSoft's tightest in terms of mechanics. There are a bunch of rock-hard, finely tuned encounters throughout the game, like Genichiro, the Demon of Hatred, and especially Ishin Sword Saint, who's got to be one of the all-time most difficult Soulsborne foes. But while I do appreciate these bosses a whole lot, there's one which stands head and shoulders above the rest, pun intended. And that's the Guardian Ape, fought within the Sunken Valley. Now this entry is a bit of an unconventional one, because mechanically, I don't really love the first phase of the boss. The Guardian Ape is a bit awkward to fight, I've never quite understood whether the game wants me to deflect or dodge the ape's attacks, and it throws poo at you. Nonetheless, I love the large arena, and the visual design of the boss is awesome. It's always reminded me of the Yasha Ape from the Baki the Grappler anime, and anything that reminds me of Baki is doing something right. But the reason the Guardian Ape is on this list at all is because of the second phase of the fight. That first time I thought I'd finally beaten it only for it to start squirming before getting up and undulating around the arena, mimicking the motion of a worm has to be one of my favourite video game moments ever from any game. It's all just so damn grotesque and even rather frightening, especially the way the music shifts, becoming far creepier, complemented by the frequent terror-inducing shrieks from the headless ape only for it to carry on slashing at you with uncanny grace from the enormous katana that had been buried deep into its neck just moments ago. The whole concept of immortality via the worm in Sekiro is super twisted and disturbing, and of course, there are various humans afflicted with similar infestations throughout the game. As I said, not my favourite boss mechanically, but really special in other ways. An interesting thing about my least favourite Sekiro boss is that it happens to be the one I just praised, only this time it has a friend and guards the entrance to the Ashina Depths. Look, I'm not going to mince words here, I hate this boss encounter. The Guardian Ape fight was so damn special and they should have left well enough alone, but no, the fight is repeated here, but even then I wouldn't have minded all that much. I really don't have a big issue with recycled bosses, or even reskins as long as they're fun. But for the headless ape fight, you also have to fight another ape, and mechanically, it just doesn't work. The battle just descends into a chaotic melee of arm swings and sword swipes, and half the time I'm just running around trying to create space between the apes, because trying to take them both on at the same time is a near impossibility, particularly with the headless one's frequent AoE terror attacks. A saving grace here is that the small one doesn't have all that much health or posture, and is vulnerable to the firecrackers, but even so, this is a terrible boss that's difficult in all the wrong ways. And that's a shame, because other than this one, there's really not another bad boss in the game.
And finally, we have Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. What a damn game, what a vast golden odyssey, and filled to the damn brim with bosses, several of which are very, very difficult, and a few of which I have troubled histories with. Elden Ring was around about the time where I started to question the general difficulty levels of bosses too, and while I have of course beaten them all many times, it would often be preceded with a hell of a lot more pain, frustration and death before victory would come my way and this wasn't always a whole lot of fun. Nonetheless, I love Elden Ring, and I love several of its bosses, again making it difficult to choose a favourite, but after mulling over the mechanics, the flavour and damn spectacle of bosses like Godric, Moog, Placidisax and Radagon, I knew there was a different legendary figure deserving of the title of Elden Lord. Godfrey, first Elden Lord. Godfrey has my favourite moveset of any other boss in the game. There's a mysterious element which can come into play when taking on certain Soulsborne bosses. It's not there all the time, and it's not there for certain fights, but every now and then, when on some tough encounter, perhaps on your 10th or 11th attempt, you enter into a flow, a state of being where you and the boss are engaged in a dance, a mortal test of rhythm, and I feel that Godfrey's moveset facilitates this flow perfectly, particularly with his frequent foot stomps, encouraging the use of jumps. By this point in the game, there's been a huge amount of hype associated with Godfrey, and you start to wonder whether or not he'll even truly be in the game at all. Of course, you fight a golden reflection of the man in the Air Tree Sanctuary, but that's a mere imitation of the real thing, because the real thing is significantly, substantially more ferocious and epic. As with several other excellent bosses on this list, there's a terrifying transition halfway through, as Godfrey sheds the body of his beast advisor, Serosh, from his back, embracing his true identity as Horalu, chieftain of the Badlands, adopting a different fighting stance entirely, one with a focus on hand-to-hand -hand combat, complemented with kicks, throws and brutal power bombs, complete with him tearing open your character's chest if it's a killing blow. Absolutely awesome fight mechanically, and seriously the second phase is one of the most terrifying in all of Soulsborne. He's so damn aggressive, with long weird wind ups to his attacks, but the cutscenes really are the icing on the cake, especially the first one where you see him cradling the corpse of his fallen son, Morgoth, and then there's the second one where you think his lion friend is going to enter the battle too, before your expectations are subverted entirely. Godfrey, thy strength befits a crown. As for my least favourite Elden Ring boss, well, there were certainly a few candidates. If I wanted to be really controversial, I'd say Malaketh. Not because I think he's a bad boss, because I don't think that, but because I don't enjoy fighting him at all. He's too hard for me, and I have similar thoughts about Millennia. But neither of these two legendary characters are my pick for least favourite boss, because it just wouldn't be right. And because, for as much as I don't enjoy fighting them, there are a ton of great things about them too. Instead, my pick simply has to go to the Godskin Duel, because this fight sucks. Of course, it's not the first double fight in Elden Ring, and these fights in general tend to be particularly brutal, especially if you're trying to play without the aid of Spirit Ashes, and even if you are using Spirit Ashes. The Valiant Gargoyle fight is another notorious one that can be very unpleasant to fight, but the reason I'm not putting that boss here is because you don't fight them super late into the game, and thus, it's still very possible to just leave and then come back later on when you're more leveled up and have better gear. In a sense, they act as something of a level check. With the Godskin Duel though, you don't have that luxury. For a start, they're a mandatory fight, whereas the Valiant Gargoyles are not. And secondly, you fight them very close to the end of the game, where you're likely to already be levelled up to hell and with great gear, and so there isn't as much of an option to just leave and then come back later. Individually, I actually really like the Godskin boys a fair bit, especially the Noble, though I've never been too big a fan of his rolling attack, because it just goes on for way too long. Both the Noble and Apostle can be very difficult encounters when you see them in places like Mount Gelmir and Windmill Village but they're also perfectly manageable. As a dynamic duo, however, they are significantly less manageable. Both can chuck black flame fireballs at you, they do massive damage with any of their attacks, both have second phases with additional, particularly bothersome attacks to deal with, and on top of all this, 
the respawn, and this aspect really is a major part of why this boss is so unpleasant, because you're not fighting one or the other, you're fighting their shared health pool, much like with the four kings from Dark Souls 1, and so any respite that comes from taking one down is painfully short lived. Thankfully, there is a highly effective trick for this fight, one that I've never felt particularly guilty for employing, and that's the use of sleep pots, allowing you to keep one incapacitated, making it feasible to handle the other. At the end of the day, for me, this boss is unpleasant to fight, and that's a shame because I think there was scope here to make it work, like starting it off so that you're fighting just the one, and then having the other one only appear after 30 seconds or something, but in its current state, it gets a thumbs down from Candle Type 1A. And so there you have it folks, there's my list. There might have been a few surprising picks throughout, or maybe you thought my list was all too predictable, I don't know. But regardless, I hope it made for a fun video, and feel free to post your own favourites and least favourites in the comments section below. And on that note, I shall give a final thank you to my patrons, and then bid you all a good day. Cheerio.